Welcome everyone at this uh, seminar, seminar, which is about uh, the benefits of routine-based sequencing of pathogens, uh, which is organized by the International Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, uh, which is an uh, international society founded in 1961, uh, and it is a federation of affiliated member societies, which aim to increase the knowledge of antimicrobial chemotherapy and to combat antibiotic resistance around the world. They have currently a worldwide membership um, with more than 97 national and regional societies, which in turn have over 60,000 individual members. So you can find more information on isaac.world. We have a very exciting uh, lineup of speakers today, um, which will speak about the benefits of routine-based sequencing of pathogens, which is, I think, uh, very timely. Sequencing is already in place for, for several years, but we see that, especially during the pandemic, more and more uh, sequences were placed in, in routine labs and, and sequencing became uh, a more, let's say, routine diagnostic tool, or at least a tool where you can do surveillance with. And uh, that's where we start with today's first speaker, um, which is Erik Badhoorn from the University Medical Center in Groningen. He's a clinical microbiologist, and I had a pleasure to work with him in the past and start working with him again. Uh, and he's a specialist in antibiotic resistance, coordinates several research projects in the field of molecular epidemiology of antimicrobial resistant microorganisms. And his main focus is to implement innov in innovative detecting, typing, and surveillance strategies to prevent nosocomial and interhospital transmission of highly resistant microorganisms. His presentation today will be on uh, NGS-based surveillance of uh, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus thecium carriage that may prevent infections. Well, Eric, I'm very much looking forward to your uh, presentation. So the floor is yours, please feel free to start. Thank you very much, uh, John, uh, for your introduction. I think I'm unmuted now and everybody can hear me. Um, my presentation is about the NGS-based surveillance of uh, VRE carriers. Um, in the Netherlands, we go uh, quite far uh, in the detection of VRE, and we are also interested in uh, carriers to, uh, to prevent uh, the spread of uh, VRE. And um, if you um, detect um, VRE timely and do the typing, you can um, detect the transmission of VRE in an early phase, uh, even before it, uh, it goes so wide that it is an outbreak. So you can use it to prevent outbreak um, in, instead of just um, counting your epidemiology. Um, I have no uh, disclosures uh, to make. Um, I'm a medical microbiologist from the medical Cent University Medical Center Groningen. This is a tertiary hospital with about uh, 1,400 beds, uh, just to give you a context. So uh, the first question uh, I would like to address is, what happens if you ignore VOE carriage and uh, only go for the, the um, infections? And this is, uh, I think, uh, an, uh, quite an important slide in my presentation to, to start with. Here you see the natural course of uh, Enterococcus phagium. Um, this is um, Enterococcus phagium in, uh, in positive in blood cultures. And we have uh, data uh, a long time back, uh, starting from uh, 1998. And this is uh, vancomycin susceptible Enterococcus phagium. Um, and here it is um, in this figure, it is um, uh, presented as a ratio against Enterococcus faecalis uh, in, um, uh, in bloodstream infections. And what you see in 1998, uh, Enterococcus phagium was uh, hardly present. Uh, we had only a few cases of bloodstream inf infections with Enterococcus phagium. And um, Enterococcus faecalis was uh, fairly common. And you see over time that the Enterococcus faecalis stays about the same, at the same uh, level. 
with Enterococcus phagium, uh, that has been a really uh, emerging hospital pathogen. Um, it, uh, the lineages of Enterococcus phagium are, uh, are hospital lineages, so they are um, carried uh, by patients and uh, spread in the hospital. And Enterococcus phagium is uh, really specialized uh, to, to, to spread in hospitals and, uh, and survive in the hospital environment. And what you see is um, the uh, decrease in the number of uh, bloodstream uh, infections with Enterococcus phagium. So from uh, 2009 on, uh, you have more Enterococcus phagium uh, bloodstream infections uh, compared to Enterococcus faecalis. And you see this uh, rising, and um, in 2016, uh, you have uh, more than one and a half times as much Enterococcus phagium bloodstream infections compared to Enterococcus faecalis. So it's not uh, replacing the Enterococcus faecalis bloodstream infections, but it is uh, add on. Uh, and we often cons consider uh, Enterococcus phagium as a not so pathogenic uh, microorganisms, uh, microorganism. But um, when you have many patients that are uh, colonized and uh, carry uh, Enterococcus phagium, um, then you will see uh, infections. Um, the vancomycin resistant Enterococcus phagium uh, theory. Um, that is uh, very uncommon uh, in bloodstream infections uh, in the UMCD. In 2013, we only had uh, two. Um, and in the last uh, three years, we had uh, zero infections, uh, bloodstream infections with uh, VRE. Um, and uh, also only uh, a few uh, clinical samples positive uh, with uh, VRE in the past uh, two years. Um, and that's because we uh, keep the number of carriers uh, very low, as low as possible. Um, we see carriers, uh, we see it uh, a lot in the Netherlands. Uh, we have uh, had uh, numerous, numerous uh, outbreaks uh, in our hospital, large hospital outbreaks with theory. Uh, but um, when you um, prevent it already, uh, when the patients are only carrying it, uh, you don't see infections. Uh, I think the infection rate is about uh, one uh, in 35 patients that are positive uh, with VRE carrying, they do develop uh, infections. Um, but uh, when all your patients become positive, yes, of course, then you will see uh, patients with infections. So you see in this slide um, that uh, our neighboring country, the Germany, has uh, 10 to 25 percent of the bloodstream infections uh, positive with uh, vancomycin resistant uh, Enterococcus phagium, uh, uh, um, whereas our uh, in our country it stays very low. And it's again, it's not because we do not see uh, theory, but it's because we prevent uh, the, the, we um, we combat the outbreaks on a carrier uh, level. Um, we put a lot of effort in this, and um, the detection of uh, fear FMB is uh, quite difficult. Uh, it's a diagnostic challenge. And um, in particular, in um, FMB uh, positive Enterococcus phagium. FMB positive fear E, um, the FMB uh, causes uh, the, the resistance, and it's uh, an inducible mechanism. Uh, the, in the, the resistance can be induced by uh, exposure to vancomycin. So when a theory isolate is exposed to uh, vancomycin, um, the uh, MIC will increase. Um, this is in contrast to uh, fan A. Fan A is constitutively, constitutively um, expressed, and you see uh, high levels of uh, resistance against vancomycin and tycopenin. Whereas in uh, fan B, it can be very low, and here uh, the lowest level uh, is uh, is four, but uh, we see it um, uh, much lower, and even completely uh, sensitive um, Enterococcus phagium to vancomycin is 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 common in uh, VRE outbreaks uh, in our in our hospital. And they are also relevant because uh, this is a, a, a study we we published in uh, 2017. And you see that uh, uh, a great deal of the isolates uh, had a vancomycin MEC uh, below four, and they were often um, a part of an outbreak. They were often outbreak related. Um, 
and because it's uh, so uh, difficult uh, to detect, um, we advise to uh, to use uh, in the screening a combination of uh, of uh, culture and molecular diagnostics. Um, theory can be the, uh, successful because it escapes our uh, diagnostics. Uh, the diagnostic evasion, uh, it has also been published by other groups. Uh, it's an uh, important uh, future of, um, of, uh, of theory. And when you do not uh, detect it in your diagnostics, they have the chance to spread. And uh, they, they are, uh, it is a success factor. Uh, because you do not notice it, uh, they can cause a nosocomial outbreak. And we also see that, uh, for instance, in MRSA, and that's why we advise to do uh, both culture and molecular diagnostics in the screening for theory courage. In our hospital, um, we do the diagnostics on uh, rectum swaps. Uh, it can be a rectum swap, uh, which is uh, a bit invasive, or it can be perirectal, that is not invasive on the same spot, or on fetus. Uh, we use uh, a selective broth for the culture, and we do an overnight incubation of the broth. And the broth is, uh, has uh, selective antibiotics as amoxicillin, uh, MVB, astyanam, chorostin, and metronidazole. Uh, we use uh, amoxicillin and not vancomycin because vancomycin uh, may suppress the uh, vancomycin susceptible uh, theory variants. After the overnight incubation, we do a PCR on the broth. And if the PCR is positive, we incubate uh, the broth on uh, uh, chrome archives uh, for, for theory. So we use uh, molecular techniques in the diagnostic uh, workflow. We look at the PCR CT values for fan A, fan B, and uh, for Enterococcus vitium species. So we have uh, three targets in our uh, PCR. And if the PCR for uh, fan B is above 30, uh, we consider it as negative, uh, and we do not uh, culture the, 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 the sample uh, any further. Um, the fan B target is not uh, not very specific. Uh, there is a, a background, and mostly in anaerobes, you can uh, have a, a false positive uh, single, and that's often um, uh, when the CT values is uh, above uh, 30. With uh, CT values between 25 and 30, it is a suspect. So we cult we do cult here the the sample. And we ask uh, for a confirmation sample, so for a next rectum sample of the patient. And in case uh, the patient has had uh, contact with another theory patient, we also um, uh, treat the patient with uh, barrier precautions, with contact barrier precautions, uh, until we know the uh, results of the cultures. When it's uh, below 25, the FNB PCR CT value, then it's highly suspect. And we ask for multiple confirmation samples and also uh, uh, treat the patient in contact isolation. Um, so it uh, really has advantages to use uh, both the PCR and uh, the culture uh, because uh, you can have a, a rapid detection or uh, even better, uh, a negative uh, result uh, uh, on, on, the, on the second day uh, uh, of the sampling. And uh, the sensitivity is uh, is higher, but as I just stated for the FMB, you have uh, frequently false positives in the PCR, so you are still culture dependent. So this is how the um, isolates look like uh, on the screening agars, on the chrome agars. And in this case, it is uh, it is simple. Uh, you see a full plate with uh, theory, with uh, dark blue theory colonies. So then um, it's easy to detect. Um, but sometimes it's more difficult, and you can have uh, various uh, colonies growing on the plate, and, and only one of these colonies can be uh, theory positive. So um, when based on the CT, we have a high suspicion that it uh, should be positive. Uh, we pick uh, multiple uh, isolates uh, from the plate and test them. And we have a, a cheap uh, um, phenotypic test uh, to detect the, the, the resistance mechanism, which is also advised by uh, UCAST. And that's the vancomycin disk method. You see it here for a susceptible strain, from commercial susceptible strain. You then have a, a large zone and a sharp uh, zone edge. And when it's resistant, uh, you can have uh, a fussy zone edge, um, or you can have uh, colonies in the ring. Uh, 
uh, or also uh, a, a, a smaller um, zone uh, of inhibition, but that is not necessary. Uh, you can also measure it uh, with, a, with a higher zone, but if the, the zone is fuzzy, uh, it's indicative of, uh, of, of VRE. And um, when you have a positive result in the vancomycin disk method, uh, we do a genotypic confirmation uh, on the isolate uh, by PCR. And then we come uh, to the NGS-based uh, part, uh, which of course is the, the topic of this uh, of this meeting. And um, what we do um, now already for uh, for six years is that we sequence every first um, isolate uh, per patient. Um, and we do that for uh, theory, but also for other uh, microorganisms, but in this case for theory. Um, and it's important that you do it rapid and uh, organize it to have a, a to, to be efficient uh, in the detection of, uh, of outbreaks. So we aim for a turnaround time uh, within five uh, working uh, days. Uh, in case of outbreak, you can even do it uh, more rapid uh, within uh, 48 hours if it's really necessary. Uh, what we do is uh, we report uh, the resistant genes and the ST and the cluster type in our uh, laboratory uh, system. We do uh, a standardized uh, CGMRST, core GMRST analyze uh, against all the isolates in the database. Um, so uh, for every new isolate, uh, we do a comparison with all the isolates in the database to see if there is uh, uh, any indication of a transmission, if there is a match in the database. And if it's so, uh, if there is a match in the database, uh, we will generate an email alert to the epidemiologist, to the medical microbiologist and the infection control practitioners. And um, they will go uh, immediately after the case uh, to see um, uh, if uh, there is any uh, AP link, if he, any connection uh, between the patients. And uh, once a week, uh, we have a, a meeting and then we evaluate all the cases, all the new findings of that week. And um, so we uh, uh, are sure that we do not miss anything. So the third part of my presentation is the inter-hospital inter outbreak uh, with a difficult to culture theory from B in our uh, region. Um, another thing that we do in our hospital is that we screen every patient that is transferred from another hospital to our, to our hospital um, to screen for theory. And we do that because the patients are often complex patients with a lot of antibiotic um, pressure, so they are they have risk factors to, uh, to be uh, theory carriers. So we screen every, every transferred uh, patient. And here you see that in 2021, um, we already ha had uh, two uh, patients with uh, the same uh, clone of ST117 CT469 from the same hospital, and they were both uh, from screenings from a transferred patient. Um, we reported this back to that hospital and they did contact investigations and they had a small outbreak in that uh, hospital. Um, in one of the cases, there was also dis uh, dissemination in our hospital, but uh, we did uh, contact tracing and only three uh, next patients from the index uh, were uh, positive. So we could uh, control it in, in a very early, early phase with only three uh, secondary cases. Uh, so uh, it did not have the chance to become an outbreak uh, in this case in 2021. Um, then in 2022, uh, we found uh, several um, transferred patients from another hospital that was positive. And this uh, turned out to be a larger, uh, larger outbreak, uh, which I will uh, go get on on the next slides. But what is uh, remarkable in these cases is that uh, the vancomycin MEC of the VREs uh, was, was very susceptible. It was below uh, 0.5 with the automatic susceptibility testing. And uh, it was, um, um, we, we missed a, a lot in, in, our, in our culture. Uh, until then, we uh, cultured uh, the VRE GOMAKAS for uh, three days. But uh, because we, uh, we, we, we knew we missed some uh, because we, we, we found them by, by PCR, we incubated longer. And then uh, on day five, you uh, only uh, found a, a few colonies positive. Uh, so they did not grow within the, uh, 
um, first 48 hours, which is uh, recommended uh, by the produ producers of the chrome archives. And we saw that in, the, in several cases. Um, well, there was one hospital with, uh, with, with a large outbreak. Uh, the, this hospital has now about uh, 60 uh, cases. They do, are doing a, a really large uh, contact investigation. And in total, we now have uh, 80 case, uh, cases um, with uh, patients with this outbreak uh, strain. And we uh, sent an alert to all the hospitals in, our, in the Netherlands uh, that we have an outbreak uh, with this uh, particular uh, type, the SD-117 CT469. And we also mentioned uh, the, the difficulties in the detection and the poor growth on the VRE agars. Uh, we did an adjustment in our diagnostics and uh, all the hospitals in the, the laboratories in our region did the same. Uh, they uh, are now incubating for five days on the GROM agar for the time of this outbreak. And the second thing we did was the development of outbreak specific uh, PCR. And uh, we have a lot of patients already, so over 80, but so far we only have two, uh, two infections. So that's about uh, what we expect uh, when you expect uh, in one, uh, one into uh, 25 carriers that uh, they develop an infection. This, this is what you expect, uh, only a few uh, cases of infection. But because we are uh, limited, limiting the outbreak in such an early phase, you do not get the figures that you see in this uh, map uh, in the surrounding uh, countries. So the isolate is quite special. Um, this is the variant with the vancomycin MIC of 8 milligram per liter uh, by automatic, sus automatic susceptibility testing. And what you see is that uh, there is a, a zone um, which is uh, highly resistant, and there are uh, smaller colonies in this zone. Uh, so it, uh, it, uh, it, it, it persists and it grows uh, also in the higher concentrations of vancomycin. And yeah, this is a bit more difficult to, uh, to see, but this is the susceptible isolate. And also here you see in a vancomycin um, uh, a hazy zone, it is uh, the growth of very small colonies um, that are pers persisting under the vancomycin uh, pressure and also in a high level resistance. In comparison, here, she, here you see the tycoplanin, uh, which has a very uh, clear zone. So we did uh, experiments, if we could uh, reproduce it, uh, that uh, the growth is, uh, is, is inhibited by the vancomycin. And uh, we wanted to see if uh, the isolate grows better on, uh, on, uh, on plates of uh, other producers. So in our hospital, we used the brilliance Fury agar uh, by Oxuit, and we compared it to uh, three other producers of, uh, of, of plates, three different plates. And we did it for the outbreak isolates, uh, the three um, isolates that were uh, fully susceptible to vancomycin, two isolates uh, that were variants with a vancomycin MIC of eight of the same outbreak lineage, and uh, a comparison with um, an, an other out uh, with an other outbreak uh, lineage that we had in our hospital with uh, varying MICs to vancomycin. And we made uh, the dilutions of the of the isolates in uh, one to ten and uh, one to hundred of uh, zero point five McFarland, um, and we added uh, one microliter um, uh, one milliliter ERS, and that's about uh, ten thousand and uh, thousand uh, colony forming units. And uh, yeah, what we found was that there was no growth in the in all three uh, of the susceptible isolates in the first two days. And only uh, on the day three, they started to grow. And al also only in the, um, the agar plate we were using and not in other agar plates. So this really reproduced what we also found in our uh, diagnostics. Um, this is an outbreak uh, that we found uh, in our diagnostics wrote on uh, day two. And this also was uh, reproducible. And here the growth was also on other uh, plates uh, that we tested. Here's another outbreak strain with vancomycin uh, MIC of eight, uh, which had a grow on day one, um, growth on day one in our diagnostics. And this also was reproducible. Um, and also on other plates, uh, this uh, isolate grew uh, better. 
Then we go to the other lineage. Um, this uh, first example is also a, a susceptible isolate to vancomycin. And here you see no growth on day one, but you do have growth on day two on all the plates that we tested. And this is an, uh, a second uh, isolate from this lineage uh, with an MSC of eight. And here you see uh, uh, that um, yeah, the plate B was the best uh, performing and C and D, uh, the growth was, uh, was, was later on. So we concluded from this uh, Gromacker experiment uh, that the growth is uh, dependent on the vancomycin MSC of the isolates, uh, but also on the bacterial load. Uh, the higher the bacterial load, uh, the more colonies came back uh, from culture. And uh, incubation time is important. But be besides that, we also saw the difference between the type of lineages. And uh, the Chrome Agar plates uh, we tested. Um, so uh, this was uh, yeah new for me. I learned this from this outbreak that um, the ingredients of uh, of Chrome Agars for theory can be different. Uh, the concentrations. Uh, well, I think all all Chrome Agars have vancomycin as a selective um, ingredient, but uh, I'm not sure of the other ingredients and uh, also not uh, of the concentrations. And uh, they are important um, and. Um, um, I think when you have an outbreak, it's important to test if your outbreak isolate uh, is growing well on the on your grown acre plates, and even compare it with other uh, grown acre plates um, to uh, select uh, the best acre plate uh, to uh, for your diagnostics in your outbreak. Because it's, uh, the, the growth was so difficult and uh, the culture could even take up to five days, uh, it was very difficult in outbreak uh, control because uh, patients are, um, are, uh, are, are unsure uh, if they are positive or negative uh, for, for a long day and you want to have a shorter time uh, to, to the detection of the outbreaks. And for this purpose, we, uh, we developed an outbreak specific PCR. So we designed primers around a unique part of the chromosome which is only present in the outbreak isolate. And um, uh, because you have prim primers around this, you get a, you get a band. And you see here the uh, positive control is in the in the final uh, row. And you see here two positive samples, um, which uh, show a, show a band uh, which uh, is uh, expected by the size of the of of, of the sequence. And uh, if the if it's not present uh, and there is enterococcyphysium, you uh, have a, a a lower band, so uh, a smaller sequence size. Um, uh, so this PCR can uh, detect uh, the outbreak and also uh, non-outbreak enterococcyphysium. You can uh, apply this on, uh, on on several ways. You can apply this uh, directly on the broth so that you use it uh, as a direct screening uh, test. But you can also use it uh, on an isolate to uh, have a, a rapid confirmation that the isolate belongs to the outbreak. Uh, so we added this uh, to our workflow. Uh, uh, and now um, when uh, the PCR is positive, we have a fan A, fan B, uh, or we have a fan B positive um, target and the Entercoccus feature uh, PCR uh, is, uh, is positive. Then uh, we add uh, the unique marker PCR and you have um, uh, results uh, two to three hours, uh, two to three hours after that. So it's a really rapid test uh, that you can, uh, is, that is very economic uh, to use in the outbreak management. Uh, the final part of my presentation that I think is very important is the regional outbreak uh, collaboration um, and the collaboration in NGS-based typing. Uh, we have a collaboration uh, for, uh, for, for more than uh, seven years now in uh, NGS-based surveillance. Uh, this started with uh, the hospitals and the, the laboratories in our healthcare region. And uh, we have a longer, uh, longer ongoing project that we uh, sequence all the carbonamides producing enterobacteriaceae in our hospital and compare it the same way as I presented for the theory. Uh, 
And I think uh, this regional collaboration is, is important. It's, it's the way to go. It's the way for the future uh, of, of typing, I think, in the Netherlands. Um, I think ideally you would have uh, several hubs in the Netherlands that are uh, that have the capacity for the, for the typing. And uh, you get then could have a, a hub and spoke construction uh, that you have a central hub that uh, that sequence the isolates and uh, reports uh, to the to, 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 to the connected laboratories. And you have a regional approach also in the consult consultation. Um, I think this uh, this would increase the capacity for uh, for typing, would facilitate for a more rapid uh, um, typing, and also could uh, be useful in the national surveillance because NGS data is uh, very transferable. You can uh, share the data um, and uh, accumulate it, and you can also use it both for the regional infection control and for the national surveillance. Uh, so we do this in our hospital uh, already for uh, surrounding hospitals. And you can see here an example, for, for instance, uh, when uh, a hospital is, uh, is longer connected uh, to us, um, they uh, get a report with all the, a list of all the samples they um, we have sequenced for the hospital before. And uh, we add the new samples to it. And you see it here, it's, uh, it's a cluster with, a, with the same CG MLST uh, type. So this way, uh, you have uh, the facility also for hosp other hospital uh, to uh, to type uh, by NGS. So to conclude uh, my presentation, um, I think I, there is a case uh, that uh, that the screening encourages that uh, that uh, prevents outbreaks. If you re rapidly detect the transmission, you can uh, stop the outbreak before it is, it, is, it is an outbreak. And also this limits this number of uh, infections. And uh, the NGS uh, can be uh, very useful in this, uh, in particular, if you have a, a rapid pipeline so that you can uh, have rapid results. Uh, the second point is that the uh, fury lineage evolve and escape from uh, detection by diagnostics. And for that, it's useful to use uh, molecular uh, techniques and uh, culturing a combination of both uh, approaches. And finally, I think uh, the regional approach in, uh, in typing uh, can be very efficient and uh, uh, it's, it's the way to go, I think. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Eric. Very nice presentation in which you combine phenotypic uh, approaches with, with, with uh, PCR approaches and, and NGS and where NGS fits and can add to uh, already existing technologies. Thank you very much. We have a, a Q&A at the end of the sessions, but uh, Eric, maybe you can also have a look at some of the questions already asked in the Q&A and maybe you can already answer some of them. We need to move on to our next speaker, uh, which is also from the University Medical Center in Groningen. And is he will talk about early detection of contaminated medical instruments by NGS-based surveillance of highly resistant microorganisms. The presentation will be given by Dr. Mariette Locate, who has worked as an infection pre preventionist or an infection prevention controller at the UMCG since 2012, after she finished a PhD in epidemiology. Um, so Dr. Locate studied health sciences and international public health in Amsterdam and nursing in Enschede and the eastern part of the Netherlands, and she has a special interest in the role of the environment in the transmission of microorganisms. And I'm very happy that you're going to give this presentation today, Mariette. The floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Um, I think you see my presentation at the moment? We do, yes. Right, thank you very much. Um, today, um, I may tell you something about the early detection of contaminated medical instruments by NGS-based surveillance of highly resistant microorganisms. I think a very interesting uh, topic and something what uh, is really one of the um, main uh, outcomes that we see from NGS that we can also uh, the real infection prevention by um, uh, finding really sources of, uh, of uh, uh, contamination. First of all, I have no uh, disclosures. Um, we all spread, of course, uh, microorganisms to the environment. We have a lot of, of microorganisms in our body, but also in our skin, and we transmit it the whole time with our environment. 
Uh, but in the hospital, it's actually not different. Also in the hospital, we will spread our microorganisms. And when it's only skin, microorganisms will not be a problem, but it's also sometimes uh, resistant microorganisms. Um, it can be that uh, patients um, um, spread the microorganism via a healthcare worker to another patient. But it's also possible that the patients have contacts immediately to each other. It will be less, but it can. It, it's also possible. But what also is an, a possibility of a transmission route will be the environment. So patients will have contact with the environment. The healthcare worker will have contact with the environment and also other patients have contact with the environment. And due to the environment, uh, transmission can occur. Um, especially in uh, a healthcare facility, um, uh, there are of course patients uh, with um, an immunological uh, poor condition um, and uh, that make them vulnerable. Uh, first of all, to uh, get some um, uh, resistant microorganisms, but they are also uh, can spread them easily. There are actually a few reasons for that. Oh. Yes. First of all, um, when you have when you have a, a room with uh, more people in one room, uh, especially when you also share toilets and showers, for example, um, there is a risk of uh, transmitting uh, um, uh, microorganisms. Um, when there is, for example, um, uh, patients sometimes um, have catheters, have wounds, for example, and uh, especially when you have this biological matter, uh, there can be a lot of microorganisms inside, so it's uh, more riskful uh, for transmission. Um, when a patient has an infectious, when it is infectious, um, they spread more easy uh, microorganisms than patients that are only colonized. And especially in hospitals, for example, but also other healthcare facilities, when uh, the patient uses antibiotics, it's uh, often easier to spread also the microorganism. Patients often have a higher load of the microorganism, um, and therefore they spread it easier. Other patients also use antibiotics. Um, they have also more, let's say, room for the uh, resistant microorganism. They also get earlier the uh, resistant microorganism. When we look to the healthcare facility, especially the near patient services are high risk of uh, the uh, resistant microorganisms and also the high touch areas. When we look to the environment at the vehicle, uh, there are different uh, environmental parts that can serve as, a, uh, as an, um, a vehicle, for example, water, but also especially the surroundings, uh, out siphon that can be um, uh, contaminated of often is contaminated with the very resistant microorganisms, especially when you put uh, stuff near the, um, uh, the sink, it can be a risk. Um, air uh, can be a risk. It's for this presentation, not the most important one, but also, for example, with renovations, um, there is a chance of, uh, of uh, spreading um, um, microorganisms via the air. And for this uh, um, presentation, especially the services are important, can be the services um, uh, just a general service in patient room, but also medical equipment like this. And actually, it's very hard to make a clear distinct, uh, uh, clearly dis distinct between the service and medical equipment, because also a bed can be a medical equipment, for example. Um, I think what's the uh, very nice thing of uh, NGS is that we make something visible, what's actually uh, invisible before. When patients are uh, in the same patient room and they both have, for example, an ESBL positive Klebsiella and the um, antibiogram is the same, um, yeah, that there will be transmission can be quite obvious sometimes. Um, but I think, and yet it's uh, much more interesting when the patients are not in the same room, when the patients are even not on the same ward, but um, when patients are related to each other, or at least the microorganisms, the isolates are related to each other, um, when there is no connection between the patients immediately. And that's actually what uh, the NGS can do. Uh, it points out possible transmission, but we didn't see without using NGS. And I will show you a few examples during this presentation. And the nice thing of NGS is you make a big database, of course, and you add every time new data. And by adding this data, the usefulness of NGS for the infection pre prevention will grow. When we get more data, we see more connections and um, we also have more work, work actually, but we can um, have better infection prevention at the end because we understand the transmission uh, much better at the end. Uh, going back to the UMCG, um, um, 
we already do NGS in the UMCD. I think it was the end of 2012, beginning of 2013 that we started with NGS. And um, we started actually with MRSA and VRE. Actually, Eric talked about it uh, just before. But since 2020, uh, we have a standard protocol um, that we perform NDS on all new, uh, all new non E. coli ESBLs. So, for example, Clefiella ESBL, Enterobacter ESBL, we um, uh, sequence. And before we only did checkpoint, which is, of course, a nice way of uh, typing already. You know which gene is, for example, involved. But uh, we saw a lot of, for example, CTXM uh, 15s. And then you don't see the relationship between these bases because, yeah, there CTXM 15, for example, is quite common. So you have no idea if there is a direct relation between patients. And um, uh, NDS was already performed before 2020, but only in specific cases. Since 2021, uh, NDS has also performed the all new ESBL positive E. coli. And actually, that's the largest part, actually, what we currently uh, sequence um, from at least the gram negatives. Um, in total, um, since 2020, we sequenced uh, uh, about uh, or more than even 1,000 ESBL positive isolates. Um, and we also have data from before 2020. Uh, and actually, there are also a few hundreds uh, in, the, in the database. Um, from 2020 on, we have uh, uh, almost 700 E. coli, uh, 250 Klebsiellas, etc. And what I already said, we also do VRE, MRSA, carbapenemase producing bacteria. But also, for example, when there is an, uh, is an idea that maybe uh, serratia, for example, is uh, sometimes a problem for the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, we also sequence these kinds of, uh, of um, uh, isolates. Here we see actually uh, a graph, uh, what we sequenced still uh, uh, from uh, 2020 until uh, April 2023. And you see actually the first year we didn't do the uh, E. coli ESBL, only a few ones. And actually afterwards we started with the E. coli ESBL and we really have a lot of isolates that are, are already in our database. Yeah, how does it look like? Uh, we all know the minimum spending tree. What you can see here, and I think it's nice to uh, have a, sh a closer look how I look as an effects preventionist to uh, this kind of minimum spending trees. Because I make a part of the minimum spending tree a little bit larger. Uh, we see all these circles. All the circles are actually one isolate. Sometimes there are two isolates in it. Uh, in this case, specific case, we added the ST uh, value uh, a type in the in the in the circle. But for example, when you add an um, a sample number in the in the circle, you can see easily how many samples are in one circle. These are actually all one circle. Here we have a one that has uh, two isolates in one circle. And actually there are no alleles difference between these two uh, isolates. Um, when there is uh, um, um, these numbers actually like 1826, that's the number of alleles difference between uh, one isolate and the second isolate. And yeah, when are isolates actually um, related to each other? I think that's one of the uh, main questions uh, where many people are um, discussing about. And I think when you have, for example, this um, uh, uh, this isolate where you have uh, almost 1900 alleles difference, I think no one is doubting about it, that there is no um, relation between uh, these isolates. But when you take, for example, the next one, I took this one, there are 20 alleles difference. And then it could be that it's a relationship, but we are not sure actually. So we have to investigate it further. Um, and when there is uh, only one allele difference, yet yeah, the chance that there is a re relationship between these isolates is really, really large. And we think that, they, uh, that there should be something going on there. Um, in the UMCG, we receive a notification from our uh, um, uh, lab technicians when there is less than or 25 or less alleles difference between two isolates. And how we interpret it, it's really depending also on the microorganisms, for example. Um, I will show you a few examples where you can see that um, the mutation rate of the uh, one uh, microorganism is different than the other one. And you should take it into account to interpret uh, the, um, uh, the minimum spending tree. Um, also, the time between isolates is important to take into account. Um, I show you also examples. The occurrence, when you have uh, E. coli, for example, it's very common. Um, then you have more often some um, probable um, um, relations. But yeah, since it's that often uh, so, so, so common, 
um, it's often not um, possible to see really a relationship between the isolates or between the patients. And it's also uh, good to realize that uh, the whole uh, genome versus the core genome uh, tree. And actually, based on all these things, we uh, uh, we do an extensive or sometimes a less extensive epidemiological investigation to see what the relationship between uh, patients actually is. First of all, the example of the enterococci. Actually, this is uh, the same outbreak as uh, where Eric was talking about the regional outbreak, uh, but it's already several years. And when we look to uh, enterococci, we see that actually. Um, unless we see here isolates, uh, the first two uh, numbers is actually the year. So this was uh, 2021, and here we see 2023. We see no alleles, oh, sorry, zero alleles different between these two, uh, between the isolates. So there are many isolates uh, within two years with no alleles difference. And um, uh, that's, of course, interesting to realize because when we see this isolate here, 40 alleles different is from 2017. It has nothing to do actually with this outbreak. It's something else. Um, and uh, it has not uh, a direct relation to this regional problem that we currently have. When we look to E. coli, um, it's actually totally different. Here we have, again, a sample from 20 to, uh, 2021 and 2023, and it's actually from the same patients. And this is what we more often see for E. coli um, when we have uh, more isolates from one person over uh, a few years. You see a lot of difference uh, between these isolates. Here, uh, in this case, there are 80 alleles difference. And this is something that we see more often. So when you look to a tree and you see this for E. coli, um, 80 alleles different can still mean that there is something going on. This is also a nice example of an Enterobacter cloacae. Um, uh, this was a problem that we had around 2017. Um, um, it was probably related to uh, um, the shower drains um, in one of the, our departments. And what we currently see is actually that um, uh, we still see this, uh, this uh, particular uh, isolate. And currently it's very hard actually to connect it to um, Problems that we know, but that we know actually from before. Um, in this specific tree, it's nice to see. I uh, show you this one because you also see the direct connection lines between isolates. Normally, you see not these uh, uh, um, red lines; you only see the black lines, uh, lines, and then you see the difference. But you don't know exactly how many alleles difference uh, this isolate is, for example, from this one because you first go to that one and then to this one. And with this connection line, you also see immediately the connection between these two isolates. And um, in this specific example, we see actually a few times per year, we see um, uh, a patient with an isolate and that's connected to the outbreak that we had in 2017. And um, to have a little bit more closer look what's actually going on, it's also possible not looking at the minimum spending tree, but taking an uh, NG tree. Um, which is a little bit different in um, yeah, how it looks like. It's actually totally different how it looks like. But you can easily see that there are some clusters, actually, that are related to each other. For example, this line is going to these uh, few isolates, and they are more related to each other than when you go, for example, to this isolate. So um, this kind of tree can help you to get a better idea, actually, um, how the spread goes and uh, where the clusters are and what actually are the ancestor from um, a specific uh, isolate. So um, it will not be uh, uh, the, 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 um, the absolute true actually, but it's something what can help you when you uh, will look to this kind of data. And what's also important to take into account that um, when you have microorganisms, for example, this Rotella, which is not very common, but we have a few isolates in our database, um, this see a connection between patients, only one allele difference. And we looked into these patients and we saw, okay, both from 2022, one from uh, the beginning of the year, uh, one of the end of the year. And we couldn't find actually a relationship between these patients. And then we looked a little bit more carefully into um, uh, this, uh, this minimum spending tree. And actually here the uh, scheme for Klebsiella oxytoca was used. And this was actually only and a uh, core genome of uh, 622 uh, genes. And when you look to actually the whole genome again, and then you see immediately an, 
bigger difference. Still, it's not a lot, uh, but it is uh, bigger than when you look only to a small part of the uh, of the cord genome. And this, especially when you have, for example, Rarotella, where this is uh, this is can be a problem. Um, often, when you have an outbreak, uh, I do put an example inside, but for example, for Seratia, we have very nice examples where we have the whole genome and the core genome. And often we see uh, one, two more alleles difference in the outbreak, but not um, uh, 12 alleles. For this case, actually, we stopped with searching and um, uh, we didn't go further to investigate what could be the uh, possible source since we uh, didn't have any uh, um, possibilities what it could be. But maybe in the future, that's a nice thing, when we have again a, a Rotella and there is again a patient positive, maybe then we have we have again this data, we can have a look again if there is something going on. Um, medical equipment can uh, uh, be a source of transmission. And I think this is one of the uh, a very nice example actually from 2020. Um, here we see a minimum spending tree. We see actually here a large outbreak. It was actually on a hematology ward, but that's not the one where we want to talk about. That's actually this one. Two isolates that are uh, closely related to each other, three, uh, three alleles difference between these isolates. And we received these results, but actually um, within uh, one month that they became positive, the one was uh, a 16 year old male. Uh, person uh, that had a positive blood culture on the 20th, uh, uh, 20th of June. And the other one was actually about two weeks later, was also a male person, but then uh, uh, 87 years old, and he had a positive urine sample. And what actually was seen is that one was actually on a ward, a pediatric ward, was a child actually, 16 years old, and the other was on the adult ward, on the gastroenterology ward. Then we looked at the specialism, it was already there, both were from the gastroenterology. So there was some relation between these patients and there was both they had an citrobacter in this case and um, they were closely related. They didn't have a direct connection, but there could be something going on here. So um, at that moment, um, uh, we look further to, um, uh, uh, to the medical files. Uh, we look to the admission, is there something in, uh, in common uh, to the healthcare workers, to the surgeries that they had, the examinations, et cetera. So we look into the medical files to see if there is something the same between these two patients. And what we find out in this case actually was that um, they both had an uh, endoscopy, uh, both had an ESP, and uh, one was performed at the 9th of June 2020, and the other one was performed at the 18th of June 2020, and they were used actually the same um, um, endoscope. So that was actually interesting um, finding, and at that moment we thought immediately, okay, we are going to culture this endoscope. We did it eight times. Eight times it was negative. Uh, we did really everything to get it positive, to be honest. We <laughs> tried all kinds of ways to uh, to do samples, but actually everything was was negative. What we all did was an uh, contact tracing. We looked back until January 2020 was the last time that the endoscope was negative before actually this uh, this event happened. And what we found was actually, again, another patient that was positive for an ESBO positive uh, Citobacter frondi. But what we also found was three patients that were carrying an, uh, or were um, uh, uh, carriers of a Klebsiella pneumonia that was ESBO positive. And one of these patients had even a blood, uh, positive blood culture, was actually one of the last, uh, latest patients that was um, uh, had an endoscopy with this endoscope. And when we did the, um, um, uh, the NGS again, we saw that this one Citrobacter for the ESBL positive patient was related to the other two. And we also saw that this Klebsiella was actually related to each other. So actually at that moment, we didn't trust this endoscope anymore. We couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't culture it positive, but we saw in the contact tracing also some, uh, some things that we didn't trust it. So at that moment, we started with dismantling the endoscope. Um, it was actually in December 2020, so it was actually five months later than we uh, took the endoscope out of the uh, regular procedures. So, um, um, and we started actually with just dismantling the endoscope. We um, um, took every part of this endoscope and uh, cultured it. And um, I can make it very long, but since of the time, I should make it short. We found actually the Klebsiella uh, pneumonia we found in a forcep uh, elevator. And um, even earlier samples, everything what we did, everything was negative. When we did the NGS, it was actually the same 
um, uh, um, Klebsiella pneumoniae that was also uh, found in the patients. Um, what we also saw, it's actually this channel, um, and everyone who knows who, uh, how a uh, uh, channel should look like from ESP knows that this is not good. Um, here we see a really kind of, yeah, probably it's something like a biofilm or something, but um, without do, we had uh, did culturing, we did uh, 23S, we couldn't culture it positive. But uh, we think that something had going on also here in this channel. So in conclusion, the Klebsiella pneumonia was cultured from the forceps elevator and the transmission via the endoscope is very probable, actually. The Citrobacter froni, we could not culture it, but um, I think that we still cannot uh, exclude that the um, transmission was um, due to the endoscope, especially because we had never found this Citrobacter back again in, the, in other patients, only uh, these patients that were cultured. And since we uh, took the endoscope out of the... Um, uh, away from the uh, um, endoscopy center, we didn't find the uh, citrobacter again. And I think as a conclusion, the NES uh, probably prevented several transmission, including infections. The last, the last patient that was uh, actually uh, had an endoscope had a positive blood culture and was very sick uh, because of this. And uh, since the patient were not directly reached, uh, related to each other, we would not have this, uh, this uh, um, endoscope take out of the um, uh, um, regular procedures, actually. We would have used it for a longer time period. So I think due to NDS, uh, we prevented here uh, several transmissions, several, especially because we even found the Klebsiella into the endoscope. I have very shortly a second example. It was actually for surgical uh, equipment. This was from an entrobacter. Um, uh, both were from uh, um, uh, 2021. Uh, one from uh, end of July, beginning of August, and then the other one was from uh, um, September. So quite closely related, one month uh, between. The first patient was a male patient, 60, uh, uh, 86 years old. Uh, he had a positive uh, sputum culture, was a patient with a tumor in his uh, brain. Um, the second one was a uh, female uh, person, 40 years old. She had a positive blood culture in September and she actually had an accident. And um, um, that was actually the reason that she was um, uh, into the hospital. Uh, again, we have uh, a positive, um, uh, we, we have an adult patient and we have a pediatric patient. So when you look to the ward, there's no uh, relation between the patients. But when you look to the uh, specialism, they both were treated by the uh, neurosurgery. Uh, so at that moment, uh, we look into these uh, medical files of both patients to see what is actually the same, what kind of equipment, for example, is used for both patients, um, which healthcare workers are um, um, related to both patients. So uh, we are looking actually into this data. And that moment, we got a uh, third patient an 83-year-old uh, uh, female with a positive uh, wound culture actually from the surgery site. And it was also a uh, neurosurgery uh, patient. Um, again, they were brought in an intensive care unit, but not the same intensive care unit. Um, the wards were also different. So um, again, we did a, a, a search in the medical files. We looked to the admission, we looked to the surgeries, to the examinations. And what we saw was actually that a lot of pa patients of, uh, all three patients had surgeries many times, and uh, but we have 28 different uh, operating theaters, um, and actually four were used for these patients. Um, but we were focusing actually on that because we thought there should be happening something on the operating theater because that is actually the place where all patients go to. Um, so we also did some observations. And at that moment, one of my colleagues was on the uh, operating theater and he saw this. Uh, um, um, specific medical equipment. It's an, uh, an, a skull clamp, and it's actually used to put the head in a special uh, position during the uh, surgery. And what we saw at that moment was actually the after the surgery, the skull, uh, skull clamp was taken off, and uh, they were just cleaning it with a little bit of water. They disinfected it a bit with some wipes, and that was it, actually. And when we looked to how this looked like, it's actually not the way we should expect that you should um, disinfect this kind of, um, uh, of skull clamps. So what we did was uh, taking cultures. And again, uh, it was uh, positive for ESBL positive enterobacter and it was closely related to the patients. 
At that moment, we took, of course, this uh, school clamp uh, out of actually all school clamps. We uh, did new um, uh, regulations for the um, uh, cleaning and disinfection. And actually, it was already done for more than 20 years. So that's also the reason why, yeah, no one was actually thinking about this. Um, and at that moment, um, uh, we haven't seen this Enterobacter ESBL back, actually. So it's very probable that this was actually due to the uh, scope clamp and uh, we updated the uh, the guidelines actually for cleaning and disinfection. And again, actually the same conclusion as for the ESCP and the scope, uh, but now um, for the scope clamp, uh, prob probably we have uh, prevented due to NBS several transmissions. At the end, I will stop with it, uh, John. Uh, typing shows only the tip of the iceberg. We all have to realize it. Um, uh, also, when you culture, for example, the environment is also not always possible to find it positive, but um, uh, there's a lot of going on. And I think uh, the NDS creates a database that will show uh, what we, yeah, invisible transmission that we didn't see before. And I think um, that when you do the infection prevention, we are always putting a lot of attention on hand hygiene, for example. But when you don't see this kind of uh, transmission, um, I think you can never be very successful because this is also a very important uh, part of, um, of uh, preventing transmission. So that was actually my story. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Very nice presentation, very clear. And again, showing the power of the use of next generation sequencing in uh, yeah, also preventing actually kind of uh, hospital acquired infections. Thank, thanks again. There are some questions in the Q&A. Maybe you can have a look at them and, and answer them. Um, then we move on to the last speaker of today, which is of Professor Matt Holden, a molecular microbiologist whose curiosity into the genetics of bacteria led him along a bioinformatic path to study and explore bacterial genomes. And although his research group's interest focused on inter investigating the diversity and evolution of bacterial pathogens, today he's going to talk about some uh, bacteria that does not have any 16S. In other words, he's talking about the most beautiful virus ever, coronavirus, which uh, I did a PhD on in 1996. It was just a small detail, and I'm very curious about your presentation, Matt. Uh, Floor is yours, the implementation of whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 to inform the COVID-19 public health response in Scotland. It's a pleasure to have you. As John has introduced, I'm going to talk about something slightly different. Uh, firstly, it's a virus, it's, and there's not necessarily related to antimicrobial resistance. But I'm going to talk about whole genome sequencing in the context of a sort of, uh, sort of national surveillance. And in this case, what we uh, stepped up in Scotland and our experience in Scotland and some of the lessons learned from that. So really, just to the, the structure of the talk is just to introduce you to where we started from. What did we do and what did we learn? And, and it's probably hasten to add, this reflects probably many of the experiences of people around the world that have been involved in the response to the pandemic. So it's very much focused on what we did in Scotland and the big commonalities, but also I think and I think relevant to this audience, we've heard the two really nice talks about the sort of local implementation of whole genome sequencing. Um, what can we learn from a sort of wider use of it? And I think some of the common themes that come through from that are relevant, whether it be we're doing surveillance on a virus at a national level as part of the pandemic response or actually implementing it locally to protect patients. And again, just reflecting on the sort of the levels at which we're working. This is a slide from uh, Public Health Scotland and uh, uh, that just reflects the sort of overview of the level, different levels at which uh, sort of sequencing and uh, whole genome sequencing can work for clinical and public health benefit. We've heard some really nice examples about how it's been locally uh, implemented to work at the patient level and local population, both in diagnosis and also outbreak investigations. But what we've been interested in in recent years is actually utilising it at a national level, the sort of national surveillance level. And arguably, you could say that's where whole genome sequencing has made the most progress, is working at the sort of reference level um, and implementing more widely as part of sort of surveillance, whether it be national, regional or global. And actually, the, the sort of local level uh, uh, sort of implementation um, is is one that I, th I think has a lot of sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of progress to go. Even though the sort of examples we've heard are really really sort of uh, sort of uh, nice illustrations of the use, I think if we look at where we've come in the last uh, 
10 years, actually most progress has been made on the, on the national level. So really learning the level, level lessons from the sort of uh, the sort of national level surveillance and how we can actually uh, implement whole genome sequencing at all three levels um, to benefit uh, patients. Again, as you mentioned, some of the examples at which whole genome sequencing can be used, some really nice examples of it used as a, a diagnostic tool for the identification of outbreaks, or indeed looking at to uh, identify genetic determinants associated with treatment failure, whether that be antibiotic resistance or indeed other treatments, or indeed as a diagnostic tool for new syndromes and, and, and diseases. Uh, again, these are areas where whole genome sequences have demonstrated its utility. What I'm going to talk to you really today is about how we've used it as a population level surveillance. And as you know, it's been widely uh, used for the, uh, the identifying the emergence and tracking the spread of high-risk variants. Also, it's uh, an effective tool for both vaccines and pathogens for uh, for, um, for uh, viral pathogens and also bacterial pathogens for vaccine surveillance, um, also for AMR surveillance, and uh, more laterally, it's been used as a tool within wastewater surveillance for a range of pathogens. But what I'm going to tell you about today is what we've done in Scotland over the last uh, uh, sort of three years in, in response to the pandemic. But just to put that in context, where we'd got to before the pandemic is that there'd been a relatively limited implementation of whole genome sequencing in, in the National Reference Laboratory. So these are the laboratories that receive samples from the diagnostic laboratories to characterize pathogen populations. So the, the investment had been relatively modest, um, both in the equipment and also the, the personnel to support it. We'd introduced two uh, MySex across two sites in Scotland, supported by a single bi bioinformatician. And the reference labs had been able to build up services for a, a number of pathogens, but again, it was from a, a limited range of pathogens and a limited number of isolates in those samples. And then really the whole picture changed with COVID as it did for, for, for many uh, places around the world. It firstly it posed a massive challenge for public health, both in the, the nature of the, the challenge we face and also the properties of the pandemic. So it led to an unprecedented response and whole genome sequencing has played a role in that and arguably the, the, the impact that genomics has had as, uh, on the, the pandemic has been instrumental in, in our response and our understanding of that. And consequently, it's led to large investments around the world um, and also uh, a, a wider use of whole genome sequencing from which we've, we've, we've learned a lot. And again, that's what I'm going to try and draw out at the end of the talk. So really, it's rewritten many of the rules as to what we can do um, in, face, in, in the face of large uh, public health uh, challenge, but also what we can actually do uh, in our response to that, and whole genome sequencing is, is uh, a key part of that. Um, in the UK, we were very fortunate at the beginning of the pandemic, we were able to capitalise on uh, a what essentially started as a, a research endeavour, which was a large consortium of academics and researchers across the UK who were brought together um, under the COG consortium led by Sharon Peacock, to make uh, available um, sequencing capacity and expertise to help start sequencing samples from very early on in the pandemic that provided a sort of initial characterization of the very earliest cases that um, we, we, we had in, in the UK and also throughout the pandemic. So this is the, the base on which we were, we were building. And again, it was the, the sort of coordination of that very early on that allowed uh, certainly the UK to start generating data very quickly and also to produce large amounts of, of data. In Scotland, we were very fortunate. We had two fantastic uh, uh, partners locally, both in the universities of Glasgow and Edinburgh, who were able to uh, support the response by sequencing samples, the very first samples that uh, occurred in, uh, in Scotland from the NHS diagnostic laboratories. And again, it was a, a fantastic partnership of both academic partners and also uh, uh, local national health service partners to ensure that the capacity to sequence samples was there, but also to ensure that um, samples were available for sequencing and also the interpretation and analysis of that and working in partnership with NHS and public health uh, partners. We were able to uh, incorporate genome sequence data very early on in, in, in our response to the pandemic. <clears throat> 
So on the back of the, the sort of uh, COG UK activity, we were able to uh, sequence samples uh, from uh, the beginning of the pandemic in Scotland. Uh, the laboratories that were set up both in Glasgow and Edinburgh were based on the Oxford Nanopore, uh, obtaining these samples directly from the NHS diagnostic laboratories, which at the time were established in, the, uh, in Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, and built up over the course of the pandemic elsewhere in Scotland. Um, initially, able to sequence samples very readily but as the numbers of samples went up just uh, setting up the facility to, to to churn through large numbers of samples and provide a greater coverage this was sort of structured to provide a level of population uh, level uh, sampling and then also more specific targeted hospital level local sampling to perhaps look at some of the more uh, sort of the focus around outbreaks and uh, some of the diagnostic uh, requirements in addition to the surveillance uh, requirements. And in Scotland, we also received uh, sequencing later on in the, the pandemic from the, the UK government testing uh, that was set up for community samples that were sequenced at the Sanger. So we were able to obtain data from COG that provided uh, both hospital and also community sampling. And on the back of that, and with part in partnership with COG, we were able to help uh, establish an end-to-end -end service for whole genome sequencing that took that linked patients and their diagnostic samples at one end through working and establishing a sequencing lab and IT computing uh, and storage facilities and bioinformaticians to analyze the data and process it, and then report data to end users. And with COG UK, we were very fortunate not only that. The capacity that was available to us to uh, set up sequencing and generate sequences, but also the expertise to establish the methods and protocols and <clears throat> some of the structural capacities for analysing the data, whether that be through the partnerships with the Arctic Network, so Nick Noman and Andrew uh, Rambo, with the, the expertise in generating the protocols for the amplification and processing data, some of the IT infrastructure in terms of the MRC climb that was made available to help process the SARS-CoV, and indeed some of the tools that have been designed that helped us to understand and genotype uh, the, the samples that have generated now, the, the genotyping vocabulary that's routine, such as pangolin, um, that's now a core part of our ability to describe genetic variants and the, the evolution of, of uh, the virus. And indeed, MicroReact is another component uh, that came out of uh, the COG that allowed us to visualise data. And we we utilised these in generating the service. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples of how we use that and how it was effective, working with partners um, at the University of Glasgow. Um, this is an illustration of generating data that provide the sort of initial surveillance. In the first month of uh, the pandemic in Scotland, um, half of all the COVID cases were, were sequenced. And analysing these cases um, uh, uh, phylogenetically, both uh, um, with the Scottish samples and also in the context of the wider UK and international samples, we're able to estimate that there were over 283 separate introductions into Scotland during that first month. And on the basis of this and combining with the epidemiological information, we were able to, uh, to draw this picture together of what initially happened in the pandemic in terms of the introduction of virus into, into Scotland. And here we can see during the first week uh, that the initial cases are colour coded according to travel uh, destination linkage that was obtained from the cases. And very much in the first couple of weeks, most of the cases in Scotland were actually had a link to uh, travel to Europe. And then by week three, the majority of the cases started to have no tram travel links. Again, illustrating the sort of uh, the sequence of events where uh, the cases of COVID um, very early on were seeded from Europe, and then they uh, spread into the community. And then from there, it took hold and drove uh, the, the cases upwards. And it's this sort of data that we were able to share with uh, uh, both our public health colleagues, but also government colleagues that helped inform and support some of the response and policy decisions that were made at the time of the first pandemic that included the sort of lockdown and also travel re restrictions. Again, another illustration of how some of the data that we generated uh, fed into our understanding and, and created an awareness of the potential of whole genome sequencing is, is this case here. Again, it goes back to the first month of 
uh, the uh, uh, sort of pandemic in Scotland, there was a case of uh, an outbreak that was linked to an event at a hotel in Edinburgh, um, a company, uh, in this case, it was Nike, that had a, a conference, an international conference, where people came from around the world. And there were a cluster of cases around this uh, that linked to the, the sort of very first cases we were identified in Scotland. This became somewhat of a, a, a political issue in terms it was identified that this event had potentially uh, was responsible for seeding infection within Scotland. And it was argued that uh, some of the response to this and, uh, had been uh, had not been effective, and therefore it, it was um, the, the sort of inadequate response that had driven infection. So it became somewhat of a, a, a contentious issue, as, as illustrated by these these news articles. However, when we looked at the the samples in the wider context, we could see that they actually all were all very genetically related on a single branch within the phylogenetic tree in comparison to what then went on to. Uh, cause disease throughout Scotland during that first month. And in fact, once we investigated those samples in comparison to other samples in the collection and compare that to the epidemiological information we had, we were able to identify, as illustrated here on this sort of single branch phylogenetic tree, that whilst there were samples that were clearly genetically very closely related, either indistinguishable or one snip apart, um, and there were a number of other samples that were re related, um, that actually these samples were, uh, were unrelated to the rest of the samples that caused disease. And we were able to rule in um, some of the additional transmission. So there were a number of four isolates we identified in our collection that were linked to that outbreak. Then we identified another three isolates that were genetically found in the same part of the tree, but actually they were genetically more divergent than the outbreak isolates and actually were more closely related to samples outside Scotland and UK. So this provided very powerful evidence that we were able to share with colleagues and indeed uh, politicians to illustrate that actually, um, in this case, the, the, the sequencing showed that um, the outbreak was not the cause of COVID in Scotland. It was not, as was stated uh, in the press at the time, the ground zero for COVID in Scotland, but actually the control measures were implemented um, that, at the time, but were, were effective and actually there was very limited onward transmission into the community. It was the additional 282 uh, uh, sort of introductions into Scotland that seeded the infection that drove it, not this individual outbreak. And again, this sort of led to uh, the sort of uh, the, the sort of uh, the, to Scot in, in Scottish Parliament, it was uh, the First Minister was able to, to uh, sort of demonstrate using the evidence from genome sequencing, actually there had been an adequate response that led to this headline in the Scottish Sun that uh, the conference just didn't do it um, uh, for COVID in Scotland. So this uh, has led to um, arguably a sort of a very wide uh, sort of realisation that actually there was a power to using genome sequencing both for policy but also for understanding the sort of transmission which at the time was extensive and it was a very powerful tool for that and also it led to um, uh, successful business cases that were able to put together that um, it led to investment in whole genome sequencing, recognising that the capacity that COVID had brought, uh, that COG UK had brought to the COVID response was very much part of uh, initial uh, research and academic endeavour that through the course of the pandemic, there had to be a transition to a more stable service uh, level delivery of sequencing. So as part of that, the, the transition over to service Scottish government made a major investment in both the infrastructure in terms of sequencing capacity and sample handling capacity within the laboratories that scales up to over 5,000 samples per week, but also in the accompanying bioinformatics capability and IT capability that really are important for realising the potential of whole genome sequencing. Again, this sort of uh, is illustrates the overview of what we, we've set up in Scotland within the NHS as a result of that investment. It's working uh, to, to put together an end-to-end -end service that links patient samples to results that um, provides um, a connection between the, the, the diagnostic laboratories generating samples through to the sequencing laboratories and the bioinformatics uh, within Public Health Scotland and the, com the, the computational capacity that's been built up. So then the reporting steps, and it's each one of these steps that's important in, in sort of delivering 
an effective service and the consideration and design of that has been central to what we've undertaken in Scotland over the last three years. And again, just to illustrate what we've done with the data in total, um, in Scotland we've sequenced over three, uh, 380,000 genome sequences. And this data has been uh, imported and integrated into the public health response within Public Health Scotland and importantly linked to data sets that are available that allow us to not only query the genome sequence, but also query it in the context of other available data sets, whether that be from the microbiology through to vaccination, therapeutics, or indeed the properties in terms of the disease status, in terms of hospital admissions, ICU and mortality. And it's that combination of both the genome data with the epidemiological data that generates the sort of genomic intelligence that allows data to be made useful. And again, that's one of the, been one of the challenges for us is thinking about what is it that we need to do in terms of delivering the service to make the data useful? Again, thinking about the sort of end users and their needs and requirements, and also the sort of questions that they want to ask. And then working backwards from that to identify the sort of analytical uh, steps and the bioinformatic pipelines to generate useful results for them that they can, they can use. And again, I'm just going to just reflect a little, uh, in the time we've got available on, on what we've done with that and, and how we've developed reporting tools. The investment within the bioinformatics and the bioinformatic in infrastructure has allowed us to actually design bespoke reporting tools tailored to users' needs as part of our uh, development of the service, whether that be at the level of a diagnostic tool or as a surveillance tool. <clears throat> Arguably, the diagnostic tool and our use of the infrastructure we've built is probably not as optimal because it's not been designed to be a diagnostic tool. It's been more designed to be surveillance, looking at high throughput, low cost uh, sequencing. But we've we've generated sort of reporting that works on both levels. From a diagnostic point of view, we set up a, a user request service so public health teams or infection prevention control teams could request um, uh, targeted uh, sequencing or analysis of samples as part of outbreak and investigation, uh, uh, incident investigations. And in addition, we would uh, generate uh, bespoke reports that would go back to users and provide support for those users to interpret the data so they could use genomic data in their investigations to help rule in and rule out outbreaks from a multi multitude of settings, both from hospitals to other uh, containing environments. We've also uh, developed the service so it could uh, analyze samples that could help with therapeutic target uh, failures. And again, with the development of the sort of monoclonal uh, therapies, um, but this has been a, an essential sort of component of genome sequence that help inform some of the clinical management of patients. But arguably, the, the sort of the most effective use of the, the, the reporting has been with surveillance within Public Health Scotland. We've developed uh, sort of analytical pipelines that uh, provide uh, case level reporting routinely. So um, we identify every sample sequence is electronically shared and uh, um, it's made available uh, within the NHS that can identify each sample, uh, each sample sequence as the genotype. And this is available uh, within the NHS. Um, we've also provided weekly reporting of rapidly growing uh, variants uh, to Scottish Government and public health colleagues to identify beyond just the variant nomenclatures, are there certain sub-variants and mutations that are increasing rapidly within the population for horizon scanning? And again, this has been important to, to meet the need for using surveillance to make the most of the data we're getting to identify what's actually going on within your, uh, your, your populations and within your variants. And then also we provided NHS board level weekly reports just uh, scanning the, the latest data to identify clusters of uh, uh, related cases, so one SNP or less, and reporting that back to infection prevention and control teams and public health teams to uh, identify potential cryptic transmission or hidden outbreaks within their data. So they have the data on at their fingertips so they can investigate and identify where um, uh, sort of transmission is, is occurring that perhaps goes beyond the sort of um, the, the outbreaks that they are, they are aware of and perhaps are sending in requests uh, for. So just quickly to just um, uh, sort of reflect on some of the lessons learned from COVID sequencing. Um, this goes, uh, it's, it's common with 
actually many of the application of all genome sequencing, but it falls under these sort of uh, five areas, both for uh, its application for diagnostics and surveillance. Firstly, turnaround time is key. Actually, turnaround time uh, for diagnostics is crucial. And again, the turnaround times that we generated for, um, for surveillance probably aren't fit for surface uh, purpose. We have a uh, a 12 day turnaround time and certainly for diagnostic and outbreaks you would want a less so again it comes back to designing the service for, for, for the need and in this case um, that's crucial and um, one of the things we noticed about COVID actually is COVID spreads very very quickly and actually the turnaround time for, uh, for identifying new variants um, within three weeks of a new variant detected in Scotland, it become the dominant uh, the dominant strain, and this was often the case for each variant we saw in turn. So then, this impacts on the, the sort of turnaround time in terms of being able to generate sequence and identify samples. Data linkage is, is crucial. Um, again, it has uh, several challenges uh, with this in terms of the practicality of linking data sets, but it's it's so important to be able to generate genomic intelligence and information governance and data sharing groups are, are crucial to that. Sampling, again, that's a, a crucial uh, consideration, ensuring that uh, you're sampling the right things, but also sampling from uh, uh, the, the, the sort of diagnostic settings where testing policy is often changing as, as, we, as we've gone through the the, the, the pandemic can, can be challenging. And also just asking the hard question as to how much do we need to sequence? Obviously having more sequence is very useful, but actually when we consider the number of sample sequence, is that is that appropriate for the sort of questions we want to ask perhaps around surveillance or could we get away with less sequence and more targeted sequence? And then finally, just considering how we've integrated the policy and practice, genomic intelligence is very valuable. We've been able to use it effectively in risk assessments as we've characterized the variance and the potential impact on, on our, our communities and our, our nations and indeed our healthcare systems. But actually one of the observations we've, we've noted is actually reporting is not enough. We need to support um, the wider interpretation of data and education for IPT teams, but also just reflect on the fact that impact of data, it has changed practice, but actually data alone will not result in change. We've got to support that. So I'm just going to skip through uh, the conclusions. Again, I think those reflect what, what I've just uh, put up in the last slide and just move on to the, the acknowledgements at the end, just the teams in the University of Glasgow and Edinburgh and also the teams in Public Health Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Very interesting presentation. Um, so. As we reach the end of this webinar, um, I would like to, um, let's say, thank all the speakers. But since you were not able to answer some of the questions in the in the Q&A, there is one question I would like you to address, which is, is there much international sharing of bacterial whole genome sequence data in real time to enable surveillance? And there was this global microbial identifier initiative to address this. Is this still alive? This is a question that comes from Timothy Barkham. Can you command on that? Who's sorry, John? Who's that for? Uh, it's it's from Timothy Barkham that uh, is asking: Is there much international sharing of bacterial whole genome sequence data that you are aware of? Can I just quickly jump in into that one? There, there is, yeah. uh, and I think um, there is various initiatives to try and promote that, and also. A crucial aspect of that is standardization of the data that's shared, not only data, but also epidemiological data. Um, I think COVID and the SARS-CoV-2 and GISAID has been a, a real sort of exemplar of what you can do and the importance of sharing data. I think um, there are clearly lots of bacterial data going into the public archive, but there are still some gaps, whether that be gaps in terms of the just not samples being provided or actually there is more delays in the, the sort of the uploading of data. So it, it's, it is an important area. And I clearly that's one uh, um, where I think we need to get better at reflecting on the, the sort of value of data that we've had from COVID. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, we're at the end of uh, time for the webinar. We have uh, 10 seconds left. So I would like to thank the speakers again. I would like the International Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy for hosting this webinar and the participants for asking their questions and their presence and hope to see you soon in the, in the next uh, event.
Thanks again and have a great day. Bye-bye.